namo bhagavate vasudevaya Take number sixteen, chapter six, sixteen. This is about eating and sleeping. <laughs> so you can repeat uh, word for word, and I don't know, maybe we can try to repeat the whole words, sentence by sentence. We start with. Don't do that. You don't do that. Anyway. We, we can take word for word at least, huh? then we have some something. So I read the verse first and then you can repeat kindly after me. Nati yashnatas tu yogo, tu yogo sti, na chai kanta manashnata, na chati swapna shilasha, jagrato naiva charyuna. Please repeat. Na, na, na never, never. Ati, ati, too much, too much. Asnata, asnata, of, of one who eats, of one who eats. To, to, but, but. Yoga, yoga, linking with the supreme, linking with the supreme. Asti, asti, there is, there is. Na, na, nor. No. Cha, cha, also, also. E kantam, e kantam, overly, overly. It means too much. Too much. Anashnataha, anashnataha, abstaining from eating. Abstaining from eating. Na, na, nor, no. Cha, cha, also, also. Ati, ati. Too much. Too much. Svapna shilasya. Svapna shilasya. Of one who sleeps. Of one, one who sleeps. Jagrataha. Jagrataha. Or one who keeps night watch too much. Or one, one who keeps night, night watch too much. Does anyone keep night watch? <laughs> uh, na. Na. Not. Na. Eva, Eva, ever, ever. Cha, Cha, and, and. Arjuna, Arjuna, O oh Arjuna, O oh Arjuna. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. There is no possibility of one's becoming a yogi, O oh Arjuna, if one eats too much or sleeps too little, sleeps too much or does not sleep enough. Report. Regulation of diet and sleep is recommended herein for the yogis. Too much eating means eating more than is required to keep the body and soul together. There is no need for men to eat animals 
because there is an ample supply of grains, vegetables, fruits and milk. Such simple foodstuff is considered to be in the mode of goodness, according to the Bhagavad Gita. Animal food is for those in the mode of ignorance. Therefore, those who indulge in animal food, drinking, smoking, and eating food which is not first offered to Krishna, will suffer sinful reactions because of eating only polluted things. Munjate te trakam papa ye pachanti atma karanat. Anyone who eats for sense pleasure or cooks for himself, not offering his food to Krishna, eats only sin. One who eats sin and eats more than is allotted to him cannot execute perfect yoga. It is best that one eat only the remnants of foodstuff offered to Krishna. A person in Krishna consciousness does not eat anything which is not first offered to Krishna. Therefore, only the Krishna conscious person can attain perfection in yoga practice. <clears throat> Nor can one who artificially abstains from eating, manufacturing his own personal process of fasting, practice yoga. The Krishna conscious person observes fasting as it is recommended in the scriptures. He does not fast or eat more than is required, and he is thus competent to perform yoga practice. One who eats more than required will dream very much while sleeping and he must consequently sleep more than is required. Here it comes. <laughs> One should not sleep more than six hours daily. <laughs> I will comment on that after. <laughs> One who sleeps more than six hours out of twenty-four is certainly influenced by the mode of ignorance. A person in the mode of ignorance is lazy and prone to sleep a great deal. Such a person cannot perform yoga. <clears throat> so the verse again. Nati ashnatas tu yogo, tu yogo sti, na chai kantam anashnataha, na chati svapna shirasya, jagrato naiva chai juna. There is no possibility of one's becoming a yogi or a juna if one eats too much or eats too little, sleeps too much or does not sleep enough. Om Magnana Timyanda Sakyananda Shalakaya Chakshura Militan Dena Tasma Shri Guru Namaha Namo Vishnu Praha Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shimadhe Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namire Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Prasadine Diva Sreshta Shunyamari Paschachami Shatayane Panchakalpata Rupischa Kripasindu Vedacha Patita Nam Alayu Vaishnava Vyonamo Namaha So, uh, just about the six hours, we we'll start with that. Uh, Prabhupada also said other things than that. He didn't just say that we should sleep, not sleep more than six hours. He said that we are individuals and we have different... Uh, we need, some people need more sleep and others need less. So, <laughs> don't take it fanatically. Only six hours. And if you sleep more, then you're in Maya. <laughs> yes, we are in Maya. Is it a surprise? <laughs> we are in the mode of ignorance. Uh, maybe that's just the way it is. Anyway, I need more than six hours, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, I cannot function. Sometimes uh, devotees had uh, fanatical we're following this fanatical in some places. Uh, only six hours, no more. But the result was many times they would just walk around like uh, zombies and actually not be able to execute devotional service. So that's, uh, that's also my idea. <laughs> that was just about this six hours thing. And then uh, this is about too much and too little. We are living uh, in a time of, of that, of extremes. People, they uh, do things too much or too little, usually. People are having 
great difficulty finding the balance. And the balance we know is we, we know what is it's called the mode of goodness or sattva guna. And actually people are looking for this. Many people they want to they are attracted to the mode of goodness, healthy living, uh, yoga, uh, they want to be peaceful uh, and so on. But usually they want the mode of goodness without God, or if they may have, they may have a conception of God, but he's not a person, so they keep him at a distance. Uh, I've been associating with uh, some alternative people sometimes, and they, they have some conception about that there is a God, but well, God is just an energy, and uh, He's not really, uh, you cannot really contact him, he's just somewhere floating around, so conveniently you can just uh, basically do whatever you like. Uh, so people are they're looking for the mode of goodness, they're looking for a, a, a better lifestyle, uh, but uh, if we don't, uh, if we don't have God or Krishna in the uh, when you say calculation, <laughs> then we will not be able to find the balance. Which, well, it's not the goal to live a balanced lifestyle, that's not our ultimate goal. But it's uh, in order to be self realized and understand uh, our relationship with Krishna, then we need to live, uh, as Krishna says, if you want to become a yogi. We are trying to become uh, bhakti yogis here. There are many kinds of yogis. Uh, Krishna is describing mainly three kinds of yoga. Karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga. In the Bhagavad Gita. And he's also uh, making a connection between all these main uh, three yogas. And uh, there are so many Nowadays, uh, many people have many kinds of yoga. They invent their own yoga. They call it, they invent a name for, I don't know what, uh, Raja Yoga, Kriya Yoga, Power Yoga, Yoga for Pregnant Women. <laughs> so, so, but this is the Yoga Shastra. This is the book, the authority on yoga, Bhagavad Gita. If you want to know what is yoga, you have to uh, ask the Bhagavad Gita. This is the authority, the authority on yoga. Uh, because we understand that uh, yoga or spiritual life has to be something recognized. It has to be authorized, not something that we just do whimsically or as, uh, something that we speculate, uh, we have to follow some authorities that, that tell us to follow certain things. Uh, so we have a problem with uh, the conditioned soul, we are all conditioned souls, we have turned away from God, from Krishna, and we have come to this material world where uh, we want to enjoy life to its fullest capacity, isn't it? <laughs> That's why we're here, everyone, in this material world. We, we want to enjoy our senses as far as possible. And we want to end without God. So, um, uh, so where was I? <laughs> You're speaking about yoga. So the, um, Krishna has created uh, this whole world. He says uh, different places in the Bhagavad Gita uh, that uh, everything is actually emanating from me, Krishna says. This whole cosmic manifestation, this whole universe. And uh, this is only one universe, we also understand. There are innumerable universes actually coming 
out of the body of the Lord. And Krishna says, everything is, everything is emanating from me. Just like pearls are strung on a thread. Do um, you have any pearls here? I don't have any. Japa Mala. In your neck. You cannot see the thread. So, good. yeah, I have also. If, if you just look from far away, you cannot see the thread. The thread is kind of in, invisible. You just see the pearls. Isn't it? It's just an example. To explain how the material world is created by Krishna, by God, and also maintained without him, without the thread, all the pearls would just fall apart. So, in one sense, uh, Krishna is, now he's, he's invisible to our eyes, we can't see him. We can just see the, we can say the, the we cannot see the cause, we can see the symptoms, uh, all the phenomena, everything that's going on in the nature, uh, the sun is rising every day at the same time. Is that a coincidence? <laughs> Some people will say that everything just came out from nothing. We just talked about this morning, <laughs> which is, uh, uh, we can say, quite uh, ridiculous actually. <laughs> because uh, when there is order, that means that there is a person who has organized it. This is just uh, simple logic. Uh, so this whole creation, it, because the, the scientists, they also talk about creation. But when they say creation, they are not aware that that means there is a creator. Huh? They say creation. So creation means there is a creator. They are not even aware that they are using that word. Maybe. So, uh, we understand that is Krishna. Uh, how do we understand that? Uh, anyone could say that. Uh, but we understand this because Krishna himself uh, comes to the planet. He came 5,000 years ago. spoke the Bhagavad Gita that we are now reading. And uh, he gave us this knowledge uh, there are many things we need to understand first of all in Bhagavad Gita Krishna is actually teaching us the ABC of spiritual life all spiritual directions or uh, all transcendentalist serious spiritualists they agree on one thing and that is Aham Brahmasmi or I am spirit soul, I am a spirit soul, or at least I am spirit. They may not agree that they are in an individual spirit soul. Uh, but at least they understand, I am Brahman, I am spirit. And that means, consequently, automatically means, as our founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada, uh, said, I am not this body. He gave both the post well, the positive Aham Brahmasmi is there in, in the Vedas, I am Brahman, or also sometimes it's said, I am that. Uh, and the positive, or the, the negative is, I am not this material body. So, uh, that we have to understand, first of all, very uh, basic uh, understanding of spiritual life. I am different from this gross material body. And it's very easy to understand, actually. Anyone can understand that a dead body... Uh, well, anyone can understand what is the difference between a dead and a living body. Anyone can understand. Nobody wants to have anything to do with a dead body. Anyone can uh, agree on that. I remember one video with Tama Krishna Maharaj where he he was asking the question what is the difference between a dead body and a living body and then he gave the microphone to people they would come up with all their opinions and uh, they were quite good opinions I don't know if anyone has seen this many of the opinions uh, or answers were quite good 
Uh, well, what is the difference? <laughs> is, there, is there any suggestions? What is the difference between a dead body and a living body? Anyone? Yes, Martin? Living body can move and talk and feel and think. Dead body can't do that. Yes. <coughs> and, uh, yeah? Anyone else? A dead, a Krishna, I mean, we can also, Krishna he says about this, but in Bhagavad Gita, especially in the second chapter, he explains also that uh, it is consciousness which is, makes the body uh, alive. That, that consciousness is spread all over the body. And that's why we can feel pleasures and pains. And then he goes on to say that consciousness, because consciousness, that is very difficult to explain for the scientists. They're having a problem there. They don't, they can't really explain it. Uh, because what is that ability to be able to, un this is a definition of consciousness, one definition, the ability to undergo experiences. What is that? If you take uh, this table, it doesn't have the ability to have any experiences, but we have, so that's the difference. Uh, we have consciousness, and uh, they cannot really explain that, um, but that is actually coming from the soul, consciousness. Uh, the soul is uh, aware, it's alive. And it's actually eternal, and it's full of knowledge and also bliss or happiness. Such chit ananda, that's the nature of the soul. So this modern society is a soul-killing society. <laughs> uh, of course, Krishna says you cannot kill the soul. You cannot kill, cut the soul with any weapon. You cannot dry him by any wind or burning by fire and so on. So you cannot kill the soul. But in one sense you can you can make yourself unconscious. And that is what people are very busy doing. They, we want to people want to become as unconscious as possible. And there are so many things that you can do to become unconscious. Uh, alcohol uh, drugs, TV, <laughs> that is also a kind of drug TV. It just make, it make, usually it makes you dull. It, people want, many people want to, uh, uh, they don't want to think too much. So in so many ways they try to become uh, unconscious. Uh, and they think that this is happiness. Uh, of course, the very extreme examples of that is alcoholics or drug addicts. Uh, if you can get as close to dying, this is great. It's actually true. That's, what, that's the best thing. Oh, I don't remember anything from yesterday. It was great. <laughs> that, is, that is the mode of ignorance. <laughs> and the mode of ignorance uh, there is no happiness. So we want happiness, we want to become peaceful. Uh, and Krishna says also, uh, what is the question of happiness if there is no peace? So first we have to become, well, in one sense we don't even have to become peaceful to serve Krishna, we can serve Krishna anyhow. But by serving Krishna we become peaceful. Krishna says, Puktaram uh, yagna tapasam sarva lokama hisvam suridam sarva bhutam gyatna mam shantim rishchate. Everyone is looking for peace. Uh, individually, collectively, uh, we have the United Nations uh, 
recently in, I'm li I live in Paris, okay, that's where I live. So in Paris they just have had a big, uh, what they call it, the COP uh, meeting. There were 40,000 people meeting to talk about, uh, I say, so-called global warming. Uh, I don't really think that there are much global warming anyway, but uh, let's not get into that. <laughs> But there were 40,000 people there, and they were all together to... They also want peace. They want... Uh, maybe. I don't know, maybe they don't want peace. All of them. Maybe some of them just want to make money. <laughs> That's maybe also this. Arnold Schwarzenegger came, and he said, You should eat less meat. So that was good. At least he said that. I don't know how much he's meat, how much meat he's eating, but it seems like he has some idea about this. You you wouldn't expect it from Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> to say that. Uh, so in so many ways we try to uh, uh, attain peace and of course uh, happiness also. But it is said that if you don't include God in your uh, peace, uh, plans for peace and happiness, you will actually not really uh, get, you will not get real happiness. You will get the Maya Sukha. You may get some happiness, or you can say some pleasure, which will be temporary. But real happiness is actually permanent or eternal. And uh, we understand that that comes from uh, the, that comes from inside and it's actually already there in us. We are already happy. It sounds strange, but we're already happy. We just forgot. Uh, it's just like a child who is sleeping. We are like children who are sleeping. We are sleeping in the illusory energy of the Lord, the external energy. And we are having a nightmare. It is certainly a nightmare, or it can certainly become a nightmare in the material world. We make hell for each other. We are very good at that. We are becoming, especially in the last century, we have become experts in making hell for each other. And in the name of so-called advancement, we are killing each other on huge scale. Uh, and that is not actually advancement. So the, it's like a nightmare uh, is, is happening is real, the material world is real, it's not false. Prabhupada says uh, many places, because sometimes uh, what we call Mayavadis or impersonalists, they will say that this world is false. Actually, it has no real existence. But we don't say that. <coughs> we say it is, it is a fact, this material world, but it is temporary. Uh, and uh, we just have to wake up and realize that, that we are dreaming uh, and that we are actually always safe in bed. <laughs> so we are already happy. Happiness is inside the soul and it is also compared to a deer who is looking for water, is running for the water.